it's a, first, it's an incredible pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, I didn't think I was a mycologist, and I'm not, but I, I, then I realized, oh my goodness, you know, when I was a postdoc, I worked with ent the Entomophthora fungi, uh, you know, as pathogens of insects for about seven or eight years, and when I was a beginning faculty member at the University of Georgia. And I remember during that period, and I was working with this one species in particular, its name changed four times during the course of my postdoc and so on. So <laughs> I'm really excited that you guys could actually get there and see if we can you know, make those synonyms actually attached to something you can get a handle on and so on. Uh, a little bit, a very brief background about me this, uh, and this website, Discover Life. Uh, I'm a naturalist since the age of three. My father was an electrical engineer, thought biology, as he described it, was crap. You could never get a job. You needed to become an engineer. So I took a lot of math, and I started programming computers in 1972 to appease dad. But I got a PhD in, uh, in evolutionary biology. And this website, which I've been programming, uh, and I, I'm in pretty much an entomologist of sorts, or of plant insects and so on, but uh, very much interested in biology. And I started Discover Life, actually to uh, help uh, provide technical support for the Smokies Project, which you'll be hearing about from Ron uh, after lunch. And then uh, about 10 years ago, we separated because the Smokies wanted to do just the species in the Smokies, and we were interested in the taxonomists who I was working with were very much interested in doing things globally. I've put cards on the back so you can please take as many as you want of these. We've got bunches and bunches for my outreach coordinator, uh, Nancy Lowe, which will give you the website and the contacts. So if you're interested in what I'm talking about and you wanted to get involved with Discover Life and what we're doing, please take a card. Uh, if you want to uh, actually contact me, uh, at the, on the front page of Discover Life down here is John Pickering and this handsome guy right here is, you know, all my contact information and so on. Uh, so I want to start philosophically because I think you guys have got way more than you think you've got done. And yes, it will take millions of dollars to do it right and pay for it, but you're all going to work for free anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, yeah, we want our grants so we can get tenure and so on. But uh, other than getting tenure, money's not relevant, OK? Uh, and it's, a, it's a, a sad thing. But since I, I got tenure in 1991, and they said to me, I, so I, I asked them, you mean I can do what I want? And they said, yeah, sure, you got tenure, you can do absolutely what you want. And I said, really? And they said, yes. And I said, are you positive? And they said, yes. I said, right, I'm not doing any more agriculture, I'm not doing any more public health, I want to go and do natural history. And at which point they go, okay, you'll never get a raise again. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm basically trapped in this position for the last 20 years, which I absolutely love. I do what I, I dream of, and it's all biology, it's everything. And what, what, I'm going to, what I've tried to do is discover life, although it started out uh, with all the Smokies and then everything everywhere, we're, we're providing technology to anybody that really is interested in natural history or understanding the way the world's put together and, and, and so on. And what's happened over those 20 years since you know, I, I basically started doing online identification, not online identification guides, I hadn't got the online part at that point, but doing a Delta-based identification guides in 1991, the technology has come so far. And what I'm, I would say to you is, it's, you've already got all the technology you need, but in another 10 years or another 20 years, it's going to be utterly spectacular. So you'll have all this will be on your little, you know, droids or androids or something that's going to be plugged into your ear or wired into your brain or something like that. I mean, it's going to be just amazing where the technology is going to be. And it's about getting this information integrated, and that's my specialty. And what I've been doing for the last you know, 15 years since we, we, we started Discover Life, this, this website, it's www.discoverlife.org. We started it 15 years ago, and um, piecing this technology together, and it's been amazingly successful. And it, it used to be competitive with other sites, and we all thought like, oh my goodness, yeah, my site's bigger than your site, and so on. And, uh, and, and then about two or three years ago, it's clear that federal funding is going down the tube and so on. And it, well, you can compete harder for that smaller and smaller pie, or you can work together and make it, it happen. So we've got an extremely good relationship with you know, both Mushroom Observer uh, through Jason Hollinger and the Encyclopedia of Life. So we provide, for example, Encyclopedia of Life 400,000 
maps, that we're stealing a lot of that information, not stealing, getting partnership with GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility that's now got over 300 million records. They ship those to us, we repackage them, we clean them up and so on, and then we put these maps out there. And the users of uh, in the Encyclopedia of Life, if they, they want one of our maps, can get it to us as a web service. So we, last month, we had 40 million hits from 350,000 users. A lot of those hits didn't come to our site. They were using it as a web service where I, they would go to the EOL, for example. EOL sort of said, oh, you want a map of this? And I'm shipping the map from my site. And the, the EOL user doesn't know it. I'll be showing you some technology where I'm pulling stuff off from this ways of enlightenment, uh, which is Jason Hollinger's new brainchild for, for lichens. And it, the idea is, all this stuff, if you've got these relationships and these partners and you're willing to share the data, it doesn't really make any difference which site it's on. It can be literally anywhere on the planet at this point. And th this all comes together. There, there are these things called mashups where you can have 10 species pages and they can, whether it be Wikipedia or EOL or Discover Life and stuff, and all these can be placed one after the next in a, in a giant page and you just look through it. And everybody can own their little piece of it and they can change it and update it as they wish, and so on. So there's this real, uh, I feel, a very sense of community and working together. And I really don't care if you put your images on Flickr, Picasso, you know, Mushroom Observer, or whatever. You can put them there, and we can all pull it together, you know, in the back end. And you, you, you guys, as non-technical people, don't need to know how that's, that, that's happening. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to start, I, I've got a, uh, a talk that I, I prepared, I wasn't sure how long I'd got, so I, I was delighted to know that I actually had 30 minutes. I thought you might re restrict me to much less. So I, I, I've got a demo, and I, I had started this, uh, and I'm going to actually crank this up so you might actually be able to read something as we're going. I was going to start with names, but uh, after uh, the, Nathan's first talk today, and I, I'm, I'm going to work down to the specimen level stuff, you could start at either level. And I, I, I love this idea, it's only a rumor if you don't have the, the, the barcode. The, 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 we've got evidence. And the evidence, whether it's a barcode, a photograph, a specimen, or an observation, i.e. just a visual or a sound recording or whatever, that's the physical evidence. And then we get up to this idea that that's an entity of something, i.e. a species, after we've run it through an identification process, and we've got you know, how are we going to define a species or a genus and so on. I feel that one of the things that you really need to do and how it makes it so much easier for the computer science guys uh, is to piece this together. And so I think that where I would start with this are the names. But the idea of you really do need this concept. You need to be focused on the specimens. Each specimen must be given a unique, permanent identifier that's retrievable that you can then share and point to and you can say this is the evidence for this and so on. You, you piece these together, you put them on maps. And that may seem logical, well, wouldn't you want to link to it? But for example, GBIF, which is the biggest database, doesn't yet use globally unique identifiers that are permanent. Every update they switch all their identifiers and if you've linked to one of their identifiers in a previous version, all of a sudden you've got a, a possum rather than a uh, an oak tree or something. It's, it's not like, oh God, I mean, this is not holding together because the identifiers aren't holding together. But if you get these unique identifiers that are globally unique and we all agree on it, then that's the beginning of your evidence. The other thing is I personally, I mean, I, I love that you guys are taking one step further. If you don't have you know, the, the genetic barcode, you've not got anything. I feel if you don't have the photograph or the specimen, you don't have anything. I mean, the GBIF has about a quarter of, a, uh, quarter of its record. So you've got about 75 to 100 million records of people going out. I think I heard a mockingbird. Yes, we'll check it down as a mockingbird. And the, the, the question is, is it really a mockingbird or is it not? And as far as I'm concerned, that's not the type of evidence we want. I mean, we really want to get down to this. And we've put a lot of effort into linking that photograph to the specimen. And I, I'll, I'll joke you, with you guys, we're entomologists and we have genitalia. So we're actually uh, <laughs> uh, linking our genitalia to the specimen, our photographs of the genitalia to the specimen, and so on. Uh, you know, it's, it's, they're way more fun and way more diverse and exciting than, uh, than fungi. But I understand you guys are a higher trophy level than wackers, OK? We, we eat, I'll show you this. We, we, we eat some of you guys sometimes. OK. Uh, so let, let me start with names. and I. I and, and Discover Life really has, I, I'll be focusing on 
uh, in, the, in, in this thing, the ID Nature Guides, which is what I was asked to talk about, a, a global mapper and an album. And the albums, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on labels where we've got these uh, ability to create barcodes, as in the grocery store type of barcodes, to uniquely identify and track your specimens. So I'm going to be uh, talking about that. And once, what we've done is we've linked albums, which are photographic albums. They can also be specimen level databases. We've spent a lot of time in linking those into a global mapper. The global mapper then creates checklists for sites or countries or states, or and it, they can be, you know, the, the, the flowers of the Orange Trail at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia in September. They can be very, you know, seasonally specific things, and then those feed into these identification guides. And if you've done it right, you can make it so virtually anybody, if you guys can identify it to species, so can a high scorer. I mean, unless it's a cryptic species and you actually have to get your, your barcode. But I mean, the idea is you can make it such that if I say, and I'll show you, if I say, OK, I'm going to have you guys identify a moth a little bit further. And you're going to go, oh, how can we possibly identify a moth? There's 12,823 known species of moth. We've got most of them in North America. And the idea is like, oh my goodness, I mean, this is a difficult. Let's go sorting through them. But if you, if you actually know where you are and when you are, and most people know that, it becomes a very, very simple problem very quickly. And, and this, this idea is, is linking those together. So I'm going to start with names. And I'm going to start, uh, unfortunately for you guys, with bees. And then I'm going to, you know, things uh, mix and mice. So the slime mold which is, is close to fungi. It looks like a fungi, right? OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then uh, it actually hit lichens uh, and, and so on, which I, I, even I know are, you know, basically higher order fungi. OK. Uh, uh, they, they do something interesting, at least. OK, so uh, bees, OK? The, the, uh, the, this is, we've spent a lot of time for certain groups, and we are now, Discover Life is the bee capital of the world, or at least on the web. We've got, uh, the, the, this is the, the world checklist of bees. It's really up to date. We know all the countries where these things are. In Eastern North America, Sam Drogi has put together a team of a whole bunch of bee people, you know, not quite as big as this group, but I mean, there's a lot of people interested in bees and pollinators, and they've built 60 guides to the genera of all the bees of Eastern North America, and now we're working on the Western bees. So we've got the identification tools, we've got the names all worked out, we're, we're getting people involved, and I got really excited about this. I said, good, we'll have bee hunt, my outreach team. We'll have bee hunt, we'll have all the, the citizens out there hunting bees with cameras, and we'll take all these things. And it, 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 it sounded great, and it got a lot, lot of publicity and stuff, until we realized that you can't identify bees from photographs. And sorry, guys, it didn't work. Uh, so we've now moved over to moths. Okay, So I mean, there are problems with this. You're trying, I'm trying to get the ideal group. Uh, that you can do. Well, the, these, the, the, this is a checklist. This is not. This is an annotated checklist which will allow you to quickly get to the species page for these bees. And I just want to show you how easy this is. Okay, and I'll, I'll pull up uh, two bees, one of which you should know, and one of which you probably won't know. Okay, so there's 19. This side of the answers. This side of the questions. So if I sort of say I want apidy here, this is a family of bee. Okay, and I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to say, give me all the apids from Australia. I hit search, and it comes up here, and it's at, say, 191. It will then have a simplify button, and if you click simplify, it will ask you additional questions about those over here, based on, and these questions only pertain to these. And so I can say the number of genera here, uh, I'll, to, I'll choose apis, and it comes up here, and then you could simplify that again, and you've got two species. And I could say, OK, uh, who, who described them? One was by Linnaeus. So these bees go back a long time. And I can also do compare images. Once I get below nine, I can do compare images. And here you are. Here are the two species of bees, the one Apis mellifera, which you, you should see on this side here, and all the body parts and hives. And there's, uh, if you, there'd be a lot more images. And you can then go to Apis mellifera here, which would be the page that we've got uh, for this species. And this would then be pulling up information. And what's frightening about this is it's a honeybee. These are the synonyms that you can search on. And it just goes on and on and on. I mean, the entomologist may not be good as you guys, but I mean, it's sort of like we have problems with names too. Uh, and then you've, you've got things uh, like uh, here's a photograph of the bee. There's a global map. These are the ID identification guides that these bees would be in. And then lots more photographs and so on. You've got 189 additional photographs. You've got a description 
and then you've got information coming in from other sites. This is this mashup. So all this stuff is coming in uh, from, from various sites. OK, so that's, that's, that's what we've done with bees. This is what you need to do for your group of fungi. It doesn't have to be all. You could start at the genus level, or you could start at the family level. You could start where you wanted to, but someone sooner or later. And you don't have to do it for all fungi instantaneously. You can build these on the fly. Let me go to Mixomyces. The Mixomyces project was uh, done as a PBI, one of these planetary biodiversity inventories. They did the Mixomyces of the world. This was Steve Stevenson at uh, University of Arkansas. And you can uh, go here and 188, I just want to show you the types of things they did. If I hit this one here, there's 48 species of these, hit this, they've got their map all specimen based. They've got their photographs. You know, they can be scanning EMs and so on. They've got an overview. They've got some references and so on. That's where you want to, want to start. And if they're interesting, you can then get people out there with cameras or you can get, in the case of bees, we have bee bowls. You collect them by, with bowls. You guys would be taking snippets of stuff and so on. All the, the, these guides to, to building this, if I click on menu, the all, everything's online tools for actually putting these, these things together. And they interface extremely well with, if I sort of said, oh, MySQL databases, and you'll have to be proficient in it. said, no, 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 we don't do that. I mean, how many people here do Excel? OK, we, we do Excel. OK, we also do doc files. We've had people send them in in doc files. I mean, we do pretty much anything. I do not try to standardize the data coming in. That's my problem. And, if, and we don't care what fields you've got in you. And, and this is completely different from most people that sort of say, oh, you must be Darwin Core, and you must have country. Well, we, if you're Spanish, we, you're probably going to call it país. And so we'll take país. And some people put the state before the país, and other people put the, the, the country before the state or the territory. We don't care what order you do it. Our software can figure it out. We can map it. We can get this stuff in extremely quickly. That's my job, or that's my, that's my, my database people's job, is to get the data in. OK, so that's, that's that. Lichens, OK. This one here now is a very interesting database. And uh, I want to explain how it's done. There's 14, uh, this is North American lichens, uh, 1,400. If I go to Cladonia, hit this one here, you'll see that we're coming along here. This is Ways of Enlightenment. This is Jason Hollinger's stuff. These images are being served from Ways of Enlightenment. We, in, some, in some cases, we do it from Mushroom Observer and so on. So you get this information in here. This is one of the more there's good old Jason, you know, photo by Jason. This is one of the more sophisticated ones. What happens is Jason, with Ways of Enlightenment and Trevor and a few other people, are doing the taxonomy and getting the list of North American lichens corrected. They correct it over on Ways and Enlightenment. Every night my server goes, every night he, he puts, pumps out a new checklist. My servers go in there, grab that checklist, pull it in, and build this guide automatically every night. And there's a little error file in case they did something. So it's sort of like you can be sitting there, and this can be as simple as a text file, and you can upload it, or you can put it, send it in as an Excel file or something. We're trying to make this simple for you. We're not trying to make this complicated where you have to put it in a particular format. It, it, and so on. OK, so that's that. Then we go out there, and we also figure out what images are there, and then all the images associated are pulled in there as well. And so it doesn't really make any difference whether you put this stuff in, I mean, EOL. You know, stick with the, the ones that are well edited and, and so on. EOL, Mushroom Observer, Discover Life. You want to have experts checking, I think, checking the boxes and stuff, rather than just letting the world go out there, because you do get some, some stuff you don't want on your sites. OK, let's say the least. OK. <laughs> OK, now, identification tools. I want to bring you into the, 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 the real world of this thing here, OK? Anybody know what that is? Come on. It's a, it's a moth. Anybody tell me what type of moth it is? We're going to identify this moth. It's, it's a small, pretty one. This, this is the wave of the future. This is a lichen moth. This is our connection here. 
This guy's caterpillar's feed on lichens. We think this is a much easier way to look at air quality than monitoring your lichens. You can monitor your lichen moths, which monitor the lichens, which monitor the air quality. <laughs> but you need to know how to identify it, so let me proceed with this. And the first thing, let me just give you a few things about this. It's got stripes down here, right? It's, it's sort of this shaped. It's 15. If you measure it from here to here, it's 15 millimeters long and so on. And you sort of say, okay, well, and it's yellow and black. Okay, you you've, all can see that, right? Okay, I could go down here, you know, and you, you can see it. I've already told you it's a painted like a moth here. But it's from Georgia. It's from Clark County. Uh, uh, you know, here it was in May. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, you've, I've given you some more information, i.e., what you would get as a collector, except for you don't have the name on it. Okay, let's go and identify this thing now, and I'll show you how easy it is. You've got a moth guide to the United States here. The Moth Guide to the United States, 11,820, what a nightmare. I don't even want to go there. I mean, and sort of we haven't put all the things in there. It's, it's going to take a couple of years to build this up at that size. But we can go to the next level. You could sort of say, what happens if we were to go to, uh, to Georgia now and, and look at Georgia? All I'm doing is adding a little extension to that URL. I'm saying it's a checklist from Georgia, US Georgia, and I'm down to 2,400 right away. Getting better, but let's, let's take it the whole way. I know I'm in Clark County, folks. I'm down to 784 species to begin with. So my problem's one fifteenth the size it used to be, just by knowing that. And now the way these guides work is you, you come along and you can answer questions in, on them. So you say, what shape was that moth? And you can say, oh, that was an arrow shape. And if you were to hit search, you would now be down to 300. And you've still got a lot, OK? And you come down here, four-wing main color. Well, I'm going to say it was orange, OK? And you can keep, keep on going. And each time I can hit the search if I want to, and it shows you you're down to 91. And you can sort of say, well, it was red and yellow. And you, you keep on going, down to 55. and it's, hang on, how am I going to get over here? Oh, no, just a sec. Yeah, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to move over here without getting the dock. Okay, stripe here. And that's going to really get me down here. So I'm down to seven already. I haven't even put the size or, you know, in there. But if I were to hit the size here, it was, well, let me just, we could do compare images at this point if I wanted to, and you'll see that I've got it. There's another lichen moth here that's really nice, uh, the scarlet lichen moth. But I, I could have just kept on going here, answering simple questions like 15 and May, and I'm down to it. And then I hit that. And that's the, the beauty of these identification guides. And you, you, you get the information we got. It's a very common, it tells you what the similar species is and so on. Okay, so you are now all moth experts and we're gonna get you completely hooked. I wanted to show you one of these guys that Andrew Miller put together. Uh, this is the same type of thing. It's just a very simple guide. I don't know how long it took him to put it together. He contacted me, we want to build some guides, do you mind? I just set you up with a guide, you get a, a password and a pin number and you're off and running. And, how, have we got five minutes? You're saying five minutes or? Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, oh my God, okay. So you can go, you can go Haleen here and you can, you can do, do that and you can compare images and so on. And it can be any image you want. It can be scans, it can be microscope, they can just, and so on. Okay, I'm, I'm moving, I'm gonna stop moving quickly now. Okay, okay. Lichens of Georgia. A lot of the people that are gonna be doing this are not PhDs. Sean Beeching put this guide together. You, you, you can't see it. It says 727 guides uh, of species of the lichens of Georgia. He's working with, uh, basically by himself, he's a carpenter. He got hooked on lichens about 10 years ago, bought himself a microscope. That's not good enough. Buy himself a better microscope and so on. And he just put this together and you can go out there and it, it, it pretty much works. So bring in your amateurs as well. And then here's Robert Lucking's uh, uh, graphist thing. Robert put this together. How long did it take him to put this guy together? I went to the Field Museum, about an hour and a half. He had in his, his data matrix in the Excel file. We imported the Excel file, bing, it's done. You'll notice there's no images here. I'm moving on to images then. Okay, so you don't have to have them illustrated. That's the next step. Okay, so now here, here you have Andy Miller's. These are Discover Life guides. Here are all his, you know, 
I wouldn't call them beautiful, but they are fungi, okay. <laughs> but nice photographs, okay. Here, here's Robert, okay, this is a, a bit more, you know, these are food for my moths. Yeah, okay, this is much nicer, okay. <laughs> Okay, so the, the idea is you, you've got people that are experts. You can go here. Now, people specialize. This is Larry Thompson. Larry Thompson has given us, each one of these is 100 photographs, and they are just spectacular. He's a bird photographer. You can go in there, 70, retired. He's doing his life's work is to put bird photographs on Discover Life for the next 10 or 20 years until he dies. He's just retired. He just runs around the world taking photographs. Thank you. We like you. Love you. <laughs> It cost me nothing, okay? Here's Vitaly, who's not retired, but doing the same thing for mushrooms. Now, you'll notice on this case here, it says fungus, 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 you know, each of this, okay? As opposed to the bird guys who got it down, they've actually got common names on these now. You guys don't, it's not quite as easy to do fungi. Now, you could say, and I think Vitaly put, puts a lot of stuff into Mushroom Observer, let me just dump 50,000 images into a mushroom observer and see how long it is before your experts just say, now I'm done. I've taken 70, my, my crew have taken 75,000 photographs of moths, okay, in the last three years. Getting them identified is a monstrous industrial task. We've done it. We started out, we did 10,000 in the first 17 months, and then we, we changed the software, we did 10,000 in the next six weeks. We've got a, an industrial strength, let's get names on these things once you know what they are. If you don't know what they are, you're screwed. Okay. <laughs> okay, Ariel Chester, I want to just put hers in here. This is a 15-year-old minority student, and what she did is she went out there and she found this species here. I hadn't seen it, 12 spotted ladybug. Oh my God, you're the ladybug queen of the county. She's now in food sciences, went into the thing because we brought somebody in and got them excited about it, okay? We, we do collection protocols here. When you're doing it, you want to make sure that you tell people to take photographs of the cell phone and the GPS before they start taking photographs. So you submit all this stuff to make sure it works. You've got a moth survey. Uh, this is what then happens if you become fanatical about moths. And here I am just taking my, my cell phone every morning, uh, the lights and then frogs, everything that comes into the lights. And you can see we're getting names on those. Uh, Go into maps, I want to show you the, this map database. We've got uh, here, this is the UARC database. And what happens is you can go out here and you can click on these points and it will tell you every point is live and it goes here. And then if I were to, for example, grab this, oops, this species here, I can then play with it. So I'm just gonna click on here, type this in, comma, paste it in and you've got the tools to go out there and start putting where you got things. So that's where that species is relative to where you've collected. So you've got the null data as well. Moving on, you can automate these reports uh, and basically create information. We put our data out the next day on the web, two minutes, okay? Seasonally adjusted. Here, here's, uh, wanted to show you this. What do we do? We collect moths. This is the moth you just saw. It had two generations in 2010, two in 2011, this years earlier. This is a, a, another lichen moth. Very warm spring, generation shifted. Nightly data put out on the web every night, automated. And uh, you can do things like accumulated species, and I'm going to show you a little video, uh, and we're going to call it quits. Okay, so videos. Okay. Data coming in, accumulated number of species, and so on. Just all automated. I don't want you to get to the automated level. Okay, I'll skip that. We're going into natural history surveys. Imagine you've got an observation. That's one specimen. You go to the survey, which is a night mothing or walking like we do tomorrow, a foray or something. And then you want to make sure you can then have structured surveys so you can put it into a project so you can look at climate change and so on. Uh, you've got Facebook. You've got Happy Moth, which is a game that we play. I'll, sh I'll show you that. You've got mobile phone app apps. You've got a, vi a recruitment video, which I'm going to try to show here. Can you turn up the sound a bit?
You can put a name on them. Okay, I'm gonna cut this off. If I can just summarize for a second. You've got lots of technology. You've got things like Facebook to link you together. You've got your phones coming in there. You've got your videos. You've got amazing technology. Put it together. Do not forget the evidence and the high quality data by following good protocols and get the public involved. In particular, feed it into the high schools and the middle schools and so on because by doing that, you're likely to actually get funding. NSF has really been pushing this out, these broader outreaches and so on. Do not ignore that and saying, well, I'm going to really get everything in this genus just for me right here because that's not going to get funded. Whereas if you expand out, you will. We've got the technology. We're happy to share it with you. It's all free and we'll work with Mushroom Observer and EOL and GBIF and anybody else. Okay. And you, yes, we'll work with you. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, that's it. Okay, I'm done.